Chapter 7 of Australian Legendary Tales Folklore This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Australian Legendary Tales Folklore by Mrs. K. Langlow Parker Chapter 7 Batulga the Crane and Gnu the Kangaroo Rat, the Firemakers in the days when Batulga the Crane married Gnu the Kangaroo Rat, there was no fire in their country. They had to eat their food raw or just dry it in the sun. One day when Batulga was rubbing two pieces of wood together, he saw a faint spark sent forth and then a slight smoke. Look, he said to Gnu, see what comes when I rub these pieces of wood together? Smoke! Would it not be good if we could make fire for ourselves with which to cook our food, so as not to have to wait for the sun to dry it? Gnu looked, and seeing the smoke, she said, Great indeed would be the day when we could make fire. Split your stick, Batulga, and place in the opening bark and grass that even one spark may kindle a light. And hearing wisdom in her words, even as she said, Batulga did. And lol, after much rubbing, from the opening came a small flame. For as Gnu had said it would, the spark lit the grass, the bark smouldered and smoked, and so Batulga the crane and Gnu the kangaroo rat discovered the art of fire making. This we will keep a secret, they said, from all the tribes. When we make a fire to cook our fish, we will go into the Binga Wingle scrub. There we will make a fire and cook our food in secret. We will hide our fire sticks in the open mouthed seeds of the Binga Wingles. One fire stick we will carry always hidden in our cumbi. Batulga and Gnu cooked the next fish they caught and found it very good. When they went back to the camp, they took some of their cooked fish with them. The blacks noticed it looked quite different from the usual sun-dry fish, so they asked, What did you do to that fish? Let it lie in the sun, they said. Not so, said the others. But that the fish was sun-dried, Batulga and Gnu persisted. Day by day passed, and after catching their fish, these two always disappeared returning with their food looking quite different from that of the others. At last, being unable to extract any information from them, it was determined by the tribe to watch them. Balural the night owl and Quarian the parriot were appointed to follow the two when they disappeared, to watch where they went and find out what they did. Accordingly, after the next fish were caught, when Batulga and Gnu gathered up their share and started for the bush, Balural and Quarian followed on their tracks. They saw them disappear into a bingawingle scrub, where they lost sight of them. Seeing a high tree on the edge of the scrub, they climbed up it, and from there they saw all that was to be seen. They saw Batulga and Gnu throw down their load of fish, open up their cumbi and take from it a stick, which when they had blown upon it, they laid in the midst of a heap of leaves and twigs, and at once from this heap they saw a flame leap, which the fire makers fed with bigger sticks, then as the flame died down, they saw the two place their fish in the ashes that remained from the burnt sticks. Then back to camp of their tribes went Balural and Quarian, back with the news of their discovery. Great was the talk amongst the blacks, and many the queries as how to get possession of the cumbi with the fire stick in it. When next Batulga and Gnu came into the camp, it was at length decided to hold a corroboree, and it was to be one on a scale not often seen probably never before by the young of the tribes. The greybeards proposed to so astonish Batulga and Gnu as to make them forget to guard their precious cumbi, and as soon as they were intent on the corroboree and off guard, someone was to seize the cumbi, steal the fire stick, and start fires for the good of all. Most of them had tasted the cooked fish brought into the camp by the fire makers, and having found it good, hungered for it. Biaga the hawk was told to feign sickness, to tie up his head and to lie down near wherever the two sat to watch the corroboree. Lying near them he was to watch them all the time, and when they were laughing and unthinking of anything but the spectacle before them, he was to steal their cumbi. Having arranged their plan of action, they all prepared for a big corroboree. They sent word to all the surrounding tribes, asking them to attend. Especially they begged the Bralgos to come, as they were celebrated for their wonderful dancing which was so wonderful as to be most likely to absorb the attention of the fire makers. All the tribes agreed to come and soon all were engaged in great preparations, each determined to outdo the other in their quaintness and brightness of their painting for the corroboree. Each tribe as they arrived gained great applause. Never before had the young people seen so much diversity in colouring and design. 
Belair the black cockatoo tribe came with bright splashes of orange-red on their black skins. The pelicans came as a contrast, almost pure white, only a touch here and there of their black skin showing where the white paint had rubbed off. The black divers came in their black skins, but these polished to shine like satin. Then came the Milias, the beauties of the kangaroo rat family, who had their home on the Marillas. After them came the Buckandir, or native cat tribe, painted in dull colours, but in all sorts of patterns. Mayras and petty melons came too, in haste to take part in the great robbery. After them, walking slowly, came the Brolgas, looking tall and dignified as they held up their red heads, painted so in contrast to their French grey bodies, which they deemed too dull a colour, unbrightened for such a gay occasion. Amongst the many tribes there, too numerous to mention, were the rose and grey painted glass, the green and crimson painted belay. Most brilliant were they with their bodies grass green and their sides bright crimson, so afterwards gaining them the name of crimson wings. The bright little Gijiragars came too. Great was the gathering that Batulga the crane and Gnu the kangaroo rat found assembled as they hurried on to the scene. Batulga had warned Gnu that they must only be spectators and take no active part in the corroboree, as they had to guard their kumbi. Obedient to his advice, Gnu seated herself beside him and slung the kumbi over her arm. Batulga warned her to be careful and not forget she had it. But as the corroboree went on, so absorbed did she become that she forgot the combi, which slipped from her arm. Happily, Batulga saw her do so, replaced it, and bade her to take heed. So balking Biaga, who had been about to seize it, for his vigilance was unceasing, and deemed him sick almost unto death. The tomb whom Lai was watching took no heed of him. Back he crouched, moaning it as he turned, but kept keeping an eye on Gunu. And soon was he rewarded. Now came the turn of the Brolgas to dance, and every eye but that of the watchful one was fixed on them as slowly they came into the ring. First they advanced, bowed, and retired. Then they repeated what they had done before, and again each time getting faster and faster in their movements, changing their bows into pirouettes, craning their long necks and making such antics as they went through the figures of their dance and replacing their dignity with such grotesqueness as to make their large audience shake with laughter. They themselves keeping throughout all their grotesque measures a solemn air which only seemed to heighten the effect of their antics. And now came the chance of Biaga the hawk. In the excitement of the moment Gnu forgot the cumbi as did Batulga. They joined in the mirthful applause of the crowd, and Gnu threw herself back helpless with laughter. As she did so, the cumbi slipped from her arm. Then up jumped the sick man from behind her, seized the cumbi with his combo, cut it open, snatched forth the fire stick, and set fire to a heap of grass ready near where he had lain, and all before the two realised their loss. When they discovered the precious cumbi was gone, up jumped Batulga and Gnu. After Biaga ran Batulga, but Biaga had a start and was fleeter on foot, so distanced his pursuer quickly. As he ran, he fired the grass with the stick he still held. Batulga, finding he could not catch Biaga and seeing fires everywhere, retired from the pursuit, feeling it was useless now to try and guard their secret, for it had now become the common property of all the tribes there assembled. End of chapter 7